That's so good. Well, I got a word for you today. If you will turn in your Bibles, um, you can turn to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. And uh, we'll, we'll show our, our theme. We're in a series on Jesus and, uh, and the five covenant names of God that you find described in Psalm 103. They're all found in the Old Testament. And we're describing Jesus in each one of those. Psalm 103, uh, 1 through 5. We're going to go to Luke 7, verse 11 through 16. But uh, first we're going to read Psalm 103. And I can't read that either. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> so we'll just, I'll just read. Yeah, if you will stand for the reading of God's word one more time. Poke your neighbor and say, I can't read that either. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll. Oh, you can now. Glory to God. It's been fixed. Hallelujah. <laughs> Psalm 103, 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his what? Holy and I love that. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. You know, you get benefits when you come to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Who forgives all your iniquities. That's Jehovah Sitkanu, or our righteousness. Who heals all your diseases. We preached about that last week, Jehovah Rapha. This week... Who redeems your life from the pit. That's Jehovah Nisi, our protection or our deliverer. And then uh, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. That's going to be next week. And that's Jehovah Shammah, the presence of Christ in our lives. And then the last week who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. All right, Luke chapter 7, verse 11 through 16. We're going to have some fun today. Now it happened. The day after that he went into a city called Nain. Everybody say Nain. Nain. And many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow. And a large crowd came from the city, was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he presented him to his mother. Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. You are worthy of it all. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your word. And now, God, I ask you to speak right through me. And if necessary, in spite of me. But I just pray that we all hear your voice. We've experienced and felt your presence. And now speak to our hearts in our own way of what we need to hear today. Anoint me to speak forth your word, not in word and tongue only, but also in power and in deed. Let this seed fall in the good soil of our hearts and grow and bear forth fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Hold your Bibles up in whatever form you have. If it's on your phone or you have a paper Bible, let's boldly declare, Father, today, this week, by your grace, I'm going to be a doer of your word and not a hearer only, deceiving my own self. Now, Lord, anoint my ears, anoint my heart, anoint my spirit, my soul, my mind, and my body to receive the truth of your word. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. High five somebody today and say, Christ is our deliverer. Yeah. High five somebody else and say, Christ will deliver you today. That's the title of this message, Christ the Deliverer. It was Christ the Savior. It was Christ the Healer. Now today it's Christ the Deliverer. Let's shout it one more time and say, Christ, Christ the, the Deliverer. deliverer. Amen. Amen. A young man came to his boss and said, hey, I, I need to have uh, tomorrow off. My grandmother died, and I need to have go to the funeral. The boss said, sure, of course. Well, the following day when he came back in, the boss said, hey, do you believe in the resurrection of the dead? He said, well, yeah. Why do you ask? He said, because after you left, your grandma came by to visit you. <laughs> Jesus entered this city called Nain, and only Luke reports about this. As a matter of fact, it's the only time in the scriptures that this city is mentioned in the Bible. It's about six miles from Nazareth, 
the modern town of Nain spelled a little differently, and they believe that's where this town was. Nain means beauty. Everybody say beauty. beauty. It was a place of beauty. It looked beautiful on the outside. I, I know that area. I've been to Israel four times, led trips. Many of you, I'm looking at Tom. I know you remember the Nazareth area. The Valley of Jezreel's green and lush and beautiful. And you can look down through there. It's not far at all from Nazareth. And it's gorgeous. There are little streams that run through there and areas. There's pretty geography. I mean, it's a beautiful place. That's why they named it Beauty. But there was an ugly problem on the inside of this beautiful place. Something in this city was killing all the men. Look what your Bible says in Luke eleven twelve. 12. It'll be on the screens. When he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out. Later it says a dead young man or a dead boy. The only son of his mother, and she was a widow. So you have a widow carrying out her dead son, and she has already lost a dead husband. Now, the cause of death is not revealed, but something is attacking the men and the young men of this city. I believe there is something attacking the men and the young men of our nation. The devil is fighting with everything he can, and what was going on in Nain then seems to be happening in our nation today. What's trying to kill you, sir? What's trying to kill you, young man? What's trying to kill you, ma'am, or young lady? Is it pornography? Is it a prayerless life? Is it a wordless life? Is it a worshipless life? Is it a relationship you shouldn't be in? Is it a lifestyle choice contrary to the word of God? Listen, I don't know what it was, but something, it's like the devil had it out for the men of this city. The daddy's gone. The son is gone, and it's left with a widow who now has nowhere to turn. I want to tell you before I go any further in this message, I believe that God created us male and female. We're so politically correct now that unfortunately there are men that are ashamed to be men. There are women that are ashamed to be women. Culture's trying to get men to become women and girls to become boys. But I want to tell you, we and the church are not here to let culture run over us. Amen. Somebody shout amen. amen. I'm going to preach here for just a moment. Romans 8.37 says, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Can I just speak to the men for a second? And this is no dig on any ladies. But men, it is time to rise up and be men. Glory to God. It is okay to be proud to be a man. It is okay to be okay with the gender that God chose for you to be. If he wanted you to be a girl, he'd have made you one. If he wanted you to boy, he'd have made you one. I am proud and happy to be a man. Somebody say amen. amen. We need men to rise up and lead. Men, we need you to lead your families to church. Quit letting your wife do it. Quit letting your children do it. It is time for men to rise up and say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to go to the house of God. We're going to get involved with God. Men, it's time to lead your friends to a relationship with God. It is time to lead your colleagues in Christ's likeness and what it means to live right. Men, it is time to rise up and run with Jesus. You ran with the boys. You ran with the wrong crowd. Now it's time to run with Jesus. Somebody shout amen. amen. This is better preaching than you're letting on today. There was an ugly problem in a beautiful place. Poke your neighbor and say, do you have an ugly problem in a beautiful place? Now, there are two crowds that are about to have a collision course. I, I want you to watch this. So, so I, I, need some, I need some help. I, Rob, Margo, Mindy, will you just over here? And, and Julius and Haley, we're going to let you come over here and be in this crowd. And Holly, we're going to let you be in this crowd over here. And then we're going to get another, you front rowers, you can you stand right here. Pete, you're going to be Jesus today. <laughs> Amen. 
Peace going to be yeah. Jesus. You just stand right there. Just go over that way. Go over that way. You're just, you're just a crowd coming in, okay? So you have two crowds. The Bible says that they, Jesus and his crowd are heading toward the city. And the Bible says that this mama and her gang are coming out of the city to the graveyard. So you have a mom and a crowd. We're going, Holly, let, just let you be the leader here. You come over here in the front. And Holly's standing right here. And you've got this mama who has lost a husband and a son. And she's got a crowd coming out of the city. Watch this. That is filled with death, darkness, and depression. But you have another crowd that's coming to the gate of the city that's led by Jesus, and this crowd is filled with faith and love and power of God and miracles. And the Bible says that they're going to meet at the gate of the city. Now, we're not going to illustrate this just yet, but they're going to meet at the gate of the city. It's very interesting because the gate is where things go out of the city and things come into the city. It is a place where two intersections meet, where it's an entryway into one area. It is an exit way from another area. You have life and faith and hope and miracles on one end. You have death and depression and destruction and darkness on the other end. And they're about to have a collision course over one boy. Somebody shout amen. Amen. Now, I believe you can be seated, but remember where you're at because I'm going to call you back here in in just a little bit. I want you to get this picture, if you will. Now, I believe, I want you to hear me. I believe with all my heart, the Lord has put in my heart that this church is the gate in this city where there is a city and a place around us here that is filled with death, darkness, destruction, and problems. But I come to tell you that when we moved into town, Jesus and his power and his love and all that he has to offer came with us. And there's a collision course getting ready to happen. You have faith-filled, Christ-like people of God here with the answer of God, with the answer to people's problems, with the life of God in them, with the Holy Ghost in them, and we are meeting at the gate of the city here to an area that clearly needs life, clearly needs hope, clearly needs resurrection. Somebody say amen. Anybody know where I'm going with this already? Somebody shout amen. I want to tell you God cares enough about you to come right where you are at and fight over the crowd that's trying to lead you to the graveyard. You see, this crowd over here is trying to lead these people. They were headed one way, and that is the graveyard. They were headed for death. They were headed to bury. Nothing good was coming out of this crowd. Listen, there are two crowds, and you got to make up your mind which one you're going to follow. Understand the significance of who you run with. Who you associate with will predict your future. Look at your five closest friends right now, and that's a picture of where you're going. Who you walk with will determine where you are going. When I decided to finally follow Christ, I had so many friends. I was into so much. For those of you that are new, I'm going to scare you here in a minute. But, I mean, man, I'm the dope smoker. I'm the drunkard. I'm the guy, man. I'm hustling everybody at pool halls. I'm drinking all night for free. Me and my buddies, it was great. Life was good. But the Lord started knocking on my heart, and I realized I couldn't run with them same boys anymore. And I didn't have the strength, hear me, I didn't have the strength on my own to walk away from them. So I prayed the only thing I knew how to pray. I said, Lord, I need you to take out of my life and remove from me anybody that's going to lead me away from you. And I need you to give me two friends. I don't know why to this day I prayed for two friends, but I did. I said, Lord, I need two friends that are going to help me out, that they're going to Hold me accountable. They're going to help me not to go back in that lifestyle. And that's exactly what the Lord did. So many of my boys I ran with, I've never seen to this day. I don't know where they're at. I don't know what they're doing. God sent me two friends. And, man, they would. I'd be like, come on, guys, let's go party. It's Friday night. And they would say, okay, let's do it. I said, man, this is going to be great. we get in the car, and they'd drive me to church. I said, I don't know where you boys are from, but where I'm from, this ain't no party. <laughs> they said, we're going to pray. 
We're going to pray till that lifts off of you. And it was in one of those little Friday night prayer meetings, I found myself started speaking in tongues, and the power of the Holy Ghost came on me. And I want to tell you, one of those friends, I still talk to you to this day. Listen, God removed the wrong influences, and he put the right influences in my life. Somebody say amen. amen. And that leads me to point number one, and that is this. I want to tell you, Jesus sees you. Whew, man, I want you to poke your neighbor and say, Jesus sees you. Watch what Luke 7, 13 says. When the Lord saw her, this mama's crying. She has lost her husband and now her son. She most likely felt helpless. You have to understand, in those days, widows at that time were the most vulnerable members of society. For a widow to lose not only her husband but also her son meant that she, was, she had no one left to support her. She couldn't find a job. She was poor and destitute. She's now all alone in this world, in a world that is very harsh and rough on women back then. She had little chance of earning a living. There would be no one to carry on the family line. Am I painting a picture? Things ain't looking good. She was brokenhearted. She was full of hurt. She was full of pain and without understanding or hope. I want a question for you today. Are you in a situation in your life that feels hopeless to you? Do you feel like there is nowhere for you to turn for help? Are you swallowed up with pain and hurt in your circumstance? Do you need Jesus to deliver you as he was about to deliver her? Whatever was going on in the city, it already got her husband and now it got her son. Something was after her family. I'm going to preach here for a second. Is something after your family? Is there something out there trying to destroy your house? Is there something out there trying to tear it apart? Is there something out there trying to kill the purpose that God has put in your home and into your children's heart? I want to tell you the devil came not only against this lady and her town, but against her family. And it left this mother wondering what in the world could go on next. Have you ever been there before? Have you ever thrown your hands in the air in the prayer closet and thought, what could possibly go wrong next? Am I preaching to anybody today? Just like, just like Job, the devil can hit you so hard and so fast, it'll make your head spin and leave you expecting the negative and never believing for the positive. It'll lead you that when God really does release blessing in your life, you'll doubt it, question it, and wonder, could this really be real? Somebody pinch me because I'm expecting things wrong. Just like this mother, it can leave you expecting more bad things to come rather than turning your eyes to Jesus and believing him to deliver you. But I've come to preach to somebody today and tell you Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you shall what? And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Listen, some of you need to rise up. Oh, I know you had a rough upbringing. I know you had this and you need to have that. I know we could all go back and lean on the crutches of our childhood and we had this happen and that happen. But somewhere along the way, when you come to Christ, something needs to rise up in you and you need to declare the thing that killed daddy ain't going to kill me. The thing that caused my parents' marriage to die is not going to destroy my marriage. The thing that ruined your mom's life is not going to ruin your life. The thing that caused your loved one to quit dreaming is not going to cause me to quit dreaming. The thing that made them quit is not going to make me quit. In the name of Jesus, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. We got to quit taking shot after shot after shot and just doing this and doing this. At some point, we got to stand up and say, oh, no, devil, in the name of Jesus, I got a big bro, and his name is Jesus, and he kicked you out of heaven, and you are bound to go to hell in the lake of fire forever and ever. And in the name of Jesus, I've got authority because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So you better back up because it stops at the bloodline. Somebody needs to stand up and shout, not in my house. 
Depression is not going to ruin your life. Pornography is not going to destroy your life. Homosexuality is not going to wreck your life. Drug and substance abuse is not going to wreck your life. Somebody shout, not in my house. Come on, stand up and shout it. Say, not in my house. Somebody needs to shout it. I said, not in my house. Man, you got the authority. I said, not in my house. Wow, praise God. Woo! Yeah. Take authority in Jesus' name. Now, I can... I, I'm sure you can tell by this amazing physique here. <laughs> I was a pretty good athlete. There was a time a while back, I could 360 dunk. I mean, I, I did it all. Four, five, 40. I mean, I was a pretty good athlete. And we'd play ball, <laughs> and they'd come down the middle, and I'd been known to block a few shots. Back then, I was way more cocky, though, and arrogant. And they'd come up trying to do something, man. I'd sling that basketball and say, not my house. <laughs> in fact, they'd try to post me up, and I'd be on them, and that's it. You see this? I said, not in the painted area. You know, the, the key is the painted area. I said, not in the painted area. You better stay outside. I'm throwing a rock. Don't you come in here in my house. Not in my house. I'm telling you, there's a painted area over your home, over your children, over your loved ones, over our church. We need to draw a line and say, not in my house, devil. Not in my community. Not where I'm at. In Jesus' name, not in the painted area. Somebody say amen. amen. Jesus sees you. Amen. Man, I love that. He sees your circumstance. Genesis 16, 13, Hagar was running for her life. She gave, the Lord appeared to her. I love this. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. If somebody in here, you thought nobody sees me. Jesus sees you. She said, you're the God who sees me. For he said, I have now, watch this. She says, I have now seen the one. Who sees me? He sees you weeping in the midnight hour. He sees you weeping over your lost loved one. He sees you weeping over your doctor's report. He sees you weeping over your failed marriage. He sees you weeping over your inability to put food on the table. Jesus sees you. And just as he saw her. He saw her. The Bible says... This mama at the gate of the city of Nain, and he had compassion on her. Poke your neighbor say, he's got compassion for you. He sees what you're going through, and he has compassion for you. You know why? He cares. Poke your neighbor say, he cares about you. He was touched by this mother's broken heart, and he is touched by your broken heart today. He is touched by your pain. He is touched by your problems. He is touched by what makes you weep. Colonel Sanders of Kentucky Fried Chicken was on an airplane, and this baby was crying hysterically. Have you ever been on an airplane and a baby's just crying right next to you? And I mean, no matter what the mama did, the flight attendants, everybody tried some. All the tricks, nothing worked. Colonel Sanders finally said, hey, would you mind if I hold the baby? They were like, we don't care. Just what anybody, something, do something. Well, he managed to rock that baby to sleep. A little later on, as they're getting off the plane, one passenger said, man... I sure do appreciate what you did for us. Colonel Sanders said, I didn't do it for us. I did it for the baby. We see God do miracles in here, and we think, oh, look what God did for us. He did it for that person. God sees you. He doesn't see a crowd of people. He sees you individually, and he sees what you're going through, and he has compassion for you. And that leads me to point number two, and that is this. Here we go. It ain't over yet. Amen. Now, I know that's good Georgia English. Praise God. I love it. I know I should say it something different, but this is me, and in my sermon, I'm going to preach it like I want to. Amen? Amen. Hug your neighbor say, it ain't over yet. 
Watch this, Luke eleven fourteen. Then he came and touched the open coffin. First of all, when Jesus sees you in your pain, he sees you in your problems, he has compassion on you. Watch this. The Bible says when he saw her, her broken heart, her aching, her darkness, all that stuff, his heart burned for her, and the Bible says he went to her. He went to her and her son. Jesus is not repelled by your problems. He, 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 when he sees you in all your mess, he's not going to run away from you. He's going to run to you. But I want you to notice something here. Every word is in the Bible on purpose. Then he came and touched the, everybody say the open coffin. Oh, I'm about to preach here. You're going to love this. The mother didn't put a lid on her son's coffin. I want to tell you today, you need to refuse to put the lid on your coffin because it ain't over yet. It may look dead, but leave the lid open and leave God to do some work. Your child or your lost loved one will be saved. It ain't over yet. Your dream isn't dead. It ain't over yet. Your calling isn't past. It ain't over yet. Your marriage isn't hopeless. It ain't over yet. As long as the lid is off your coffin, there is still room for a resurrection from Jesus Christ. Don't put the lid on my coffin. Poke your neighbor. Say, don't put the lid on my coffin. Look, I know you know my past. I know you can't see it. I know you know what I'm struggling with, but God is getting ready to resurrect something in my life. God's about to get you out of your box. Oh, man. God's about to get our church out of the box. God's about to get your marriage out of that box. God's about to get your family members out of that box. You just need to live to live open and say, I, can't, I don't see any hope. I don't see any way, but I'm going to leave the lid open because maybe, just maybe, Jesus will show up and raise my issue up. Don't put a lid on it because there's an opportunity for a resurrection. <laughs> I know it looks bad right now. I know it looks like it's over. I know it looks like you're in a box with no hope of getting out. But you're about to encounter Jesus. Yeah. Romans 8, 11, And if the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Poke your neighbor and say, don't put a lid on it. <laughs> Jesus came to her. He saw the open coffin, which is, to me, it's, you know, God, this thing looks hopeless. It looks dead. It looks like there's no way out. But I'm going to leave the lid open just in case you want to do a miracle today. I know what the doctor said, but I'm going to leave the lid open. I know little Johnny lost his ever-loving mind, but I'm going I'm to leave the lid open. I know my marriage don't look like there's no way. I'm going to leave the lid open. I'm going to leave the lid open to allow God an opportunity for a miracle. Yes. Then Jesus touched the coffin, came to her, walked over to the open coffin, and he touched the open coffin. Just like I preached with the leper last week, Jesus bypassed all traditional beliefs back then. Because you see, back then, according to Jewish tradition, if you touched a coffin or the dead person, you were now unclean. The person became unclean, unacceptable to God. They became polluted and contaminated by the corpse. But I want to tell you, just like when Jesus touched the leper and didn't get contaminated, he touched the coffin this week. And it's to teach us that you can't pollute him with all your mess. You can't contaminate him with all your stuff. You can't just somehow mess him up with your death, darkness, and depression. You let Jesus touch it, and it's going to come to life. Somebody shout amen. amen. Not only that... But when he touched the coffin, watch what verse 14 says. He came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. Jesus shows up. He touches the coffin, and the funeral stops. The pallbearers just stop. They know, I don't know if they knew who Jesus was. I don't know if they knew. I don't know what they knew. But all I can tell you is they just stood still. The whole procession stopped. Darkness stopped, depression stopped, the route to the graveyard stopped, 
everything stop. I want to tell you today, God knows how to stop the momentum of darkness in your life. He knows how, just one simple touch, to stop the depression in your life and the anxiety in your life. He knows how to stop death and destruction in your life. He knows that your life is headed towards the graveyard and one touch from Jesus will cause it to stop in its tracks and all of a sudden, there is no more route going the wrong way. I want to tell you, one touch from Jesus today will change everything. Have you ever felt like darkness was carrying you? Have you ever felt like that you were in a wave of darkness and you couldn't get out? I've been there. You know the right things to pray. You know the right things. Well, I'm going to worship God. I'll get out. And it just seem like you can't get out. You wonder if anything can stop the momentum of darkness and destruction that you're in. Well, I've got news for you. Jesus is our deliverer. Jesus can deliver you out of any wave of darkness, any wave of depression, any wave of fear or anxiety or destruction. Jesus is greater than your darkness, greater than your depression, greater than your destruction. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. I like what he says to the mom. When the Lord saw her in verse 13, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Poke your neighbor and say, Don't cry. The first thing Jesus said to this mama, watch this, before he even raised her son up, was don't cry. Moms and dads, God's heard your prayers and he sees your tears over your children. Don't cry. You left that lid open and God's about to raise them up. I can't even tell you how much I feel that. You left that lid open and God says, I'm about to raise them up. You'll be glad you left the coffin open when he's done. (laughs) My daughter don't care. I didn't know if Haley would ever get saved. I remember slipping papers under her. I remember telling Haley to her face. I said, honey, if you choose to go to hell, if you think you're going to get back at us, baby doll, it don't work that way. Because there's no crying in heaven. So, you know, I just personally believe, I can't prove it. I don't believe you'll remember everybody from the earth. Because if you did, you'd be heartbroken all the time in heaven over the fact they're in hell. So I said, if you want to take yourself to hell, I said, you ain't getting us because we won't even remember you. Now, that's not easy to tell your daughter, but I believe it. Praise God, she's saved now, and we're going to remember together and dance around the thorn together. Because Holly and I chose to leave the lid open. I know it didn't look good. I know she smoked dope every day at lunchtime at the school. I know she had teachers giving her visine to get the red out of her eyes. I know all that stuff. But I know she's here today, and she's serving God, filled with the Holy Ghost, serving Jesus. Leading other teenagers to serve God. Somebody praise the Lord. Some of you are in here, you're like, I don't know who this new cat is, but he got some issues going on. That's all right. I'm open about it. We do have some issues, but God's resolving most all of them. And I'm telling you, there's coming a moment where the tears will be gone and you'll see my son preach the gospel. You better hear me. Your child may be on skin row, but Jesus is about to raise him up. D.L. Moody was suddenly called upon in his younger ministry days to preach a funeral sermon. He thought, hmm, I better go to the four gospels and get one of Jesus' funeral sermons. Although, he searched in vain. He said, I found that Christ broke up every funeral he ever went to. (laughs) And you can't find a Jesus funeral sermon anywhere in the Bible. Because death cannot exist anywhere he is. When the dead hear his voice, they come to life. Your son or your daughter may be dead, but when they hear the voice of Jesus, they're going to come to life. Your marriage may seem dead, but when the voice of Jesus speaks, it's going to come to life. Glory to God Almighty. And that leads me to point number three, and that is Jesus will resurrect you. 
Luke eleven fourteen 14 says, he came, touched the open coffin. Those who carry stood still. The darkness stopped. And he says, young man, I say to you, arise. He speaks to the boy who is dead. And he says, get up. Arise. Jesus is speaking, watch this, to someone who has lost the capacity to hear. He is speaking to someone that doesn't even know how to listen anymore. Maybe you've been trying to speak to a son or daughter or a husband and wife or a a father or a mother or somebody in your life that they don't even know how to listen to you. If you're going to have your miracle, you're going to have to learn to speak to things that don't know how to listen. Say, how can they do that? They don't have ears. Well, I don't know. But Ezekiel spoke to some dry bones who don't have ears, and they came to life. So I want here to tell you, you can speak scriptures and life over your loved ones, and they will come to life through the power of Jesus Christ. You may feel crazy. Oh, I don't know, Pastor. I'm going to look crazy. I'm going to feel crazy. What will they all think? Well, do you want a miracle or do you not? I don't care. Listen, there have been times where the devil is loose in my house. I don't care if the neighbors knew or not. You can ask my family. I got me some olive oil out the kitchen cabinet. I went and opened the door, and I screamed at the foot of the door, get out of my house in the name of Jesus. Devil, you're not coming in here no more. This is my house, my property. Only the Spirit of God is welcome. I went around anointing doors and windows. I went around dumping oil on the edge of the property. You think, well, pastor, them neighbors think you crazy. I don't care. I want the Spirit of Almighty God in my house. I want Jesus loosed on my children. I want on him loose on my health, on my finances, on every area of my life. I don't really care what somebody thinks. I want Jesus. Woo! Get up. Arise. Speak faith over your circumstances. Speak scriptures over your diagnosis. Prophesy over your loved ones. Dead dreams, get up. Dead hope, get up. Dead health, get up. Dead loved ones, get up. Dead ministry, get up. Get up out of your box. Get up out of that sin. Get up out of that mess. Get up out of that pornography. Get up out of that homosexuality. Get up out of that adultery. I say unto thee, arise. Oh, you're about to shout on this one. Look at verse 15. So he who was dead sat up, and the first thing he did was begin to speak. When Jesus raised the boy up, the first thing the boy did was open his mouth and speak. I believe that's why the devil wanted to kill him in the first place. Somebody needs to hear this because the devil knows, listen, if God ever opens your child's mouth, the whole city will get transformed. Well, I don't see no way. He got up and he spoke, but I don't see nothing about no city being transformed. Let's look at the next verse. Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God. Saying, a great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. So watch this. I need my two crowds very quickly. I need my two crowds. Come on. Crowd one over here, death, darkness, despair, destruction, and I need Jesus and his crew over here. Jesus raises him up, and all of a sudden, right here at the gate... Jesus, I want you to come and stop right here. I want y'all to come. He's right at the gate. All of a sudden, the crew with death, depression, darkness, despair, on their way to the graveyard, watch this. Are you ready? Joins. Jesus. Come on, come on. Just join his crew. They join. No, you got to join the crew. Get on over here and the crew. What are you doing? Huh? Watch this. When a person or a group of people uh uh-huh, filled with darkness and destruction and despair and all that stuff, 
joins Jesus and his crew. All the graveyard, all that stuff's left out inside the city. It's gone. Now they're filled with faith. They're filled with life. They're filled with hope. They're filled with resurrection. All of a sudden, everything in their life changed when Jesus raised up one young man. Somebody shout amen. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Just stay right here with me. When the Holy Spirit brings life to this boy, the whole crowd comes to life. The mourners begin to worship. The weepers begin to worship. Fear and reverence fall on them. And the Bible says they glorified God. Let me give you a little Greek very quickly and we're going to pray. Now, I ain't even going to try to pronounce the Greek, but it's in the, it's in the parentheses. They glorified God. This tense is the imperfect active, which means they begin to glorify God. How do you know they were transformed? Why well, they praise God? But they praised God right then, but then they went back to the life. Uh, uh, uh. When you read the Greek, it says they pray, they begin to glorify God. Watch this. And continued to glorify God. That means they didn't stop praising and worshiping. That means one resurrection caused a citywide revival. Oh, the whole city, watch this, was waiting on one boy to come to life. <laughs> Where's the one this morning? Where is the one girl or boy that God's picking out to bring a revival to your school? Where's the one person God has selected to raise you up to change this whole community? The community was waiting on one resurrection. Jesus is our deliverer. Let me share this one story and we'll pray. During the Holocaust, Dr. Kirsten, who was crazy Himmel's right-hand man, rescued thousands from death, sure death from the Nazis. Dr. Kirsten and his influence to keep many from becoming victims of the killers who led Germany. Week by week, Kirsten snatched victims from the concentration camps and gas chambers. The World Jewish Council credits this one doctor with saving 60,000 Jews. And the number of Dutch, Poles, Finns, and Norwegians he saved is difficult to estimate. The great influence of this little-known quiet man delivered tens of thousands. Well, I'm here to tell you that the delivering power of Jesus Christ has delivered more than hundreds, more than thousands more than tens of thousands. He has delivered, multiplied millions and billions. And his name is Jesus. Whew. Musicians, come on up. I've got a question for you today. Are you in a box? Is there some area of your life you need deliverance? Do your children need to be saved? Do you have a terrible doctor's report? Are you in a place where you just feel like you're swallowed up in darkness, depression, despair? Whew. So I'm telling you, Jesus is here right now. Whew. If you're physically able, I ask everybody to stand. Those that have been trained in altar, and listen, I'm on, I'm on, I know there's folks that we're not, we haven't had a chance to meet yet. I'm going to have some altar prayer training here soon. But for those of you that have had time to pray with and we, we train together, I want you to come and line up. And I want men to come to men and women to come to women. That's the proper way to do things. And I want you just to come. There's anointing oil up here. I want you to come, elders, elders, wives, those of you that have been trained that you've walked through, we know you and know your spirit. I want you to come and you get ready to pray. Surely there's somebody here. 